Good evening, everybody. It is great to see all of you. I hope that you are all doing quite well tonight. Now, let's see. First song is going to be number 957. Number 957. And while you're turning there, I'll run through the announcements right quick. And that is, make sure you got your announcement sheet via email. If you didn't, make sure to let us know. Uh, new member breakfast is on Saturday. Uh, at 9.30, LTC is the 29th and 30th uh, out at Scottsdale. Uh, so if you were interested in going to that, that would be wonderful. Um, do want to also let you know about some good news. Uh, we had two baptisms today. I know, it's exciting, isn't it? Um, you may know uh, George and uh, Holly. Uh, you've probably seen them come in. They've been visiting with us for, what, maybe two months now, something like that. Um, so, say again. They were sick for a hot minute. Um, so anyways, they were baptized today. So when you see them on Sunday, make sure to say hi to them. It was cold. 67.1 degrees. It was quick. So we did it very quick. Everything that could be done outside was done outside of the baptistry. <laughs> I told him, I said, well, you might feel the spirit moving or you might feel your heart failing. We're not sure which one, but one of the two. All right, number 957. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore just up in glory land we'll live eternally the saints on every hand are shouting victory their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore and I can't feel at home in this world anymore oh Lord you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. All righty, number nine, or nine, number 543. There's a big difference between nine and five. Number 543, 543. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Number 533. Number 533. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd, watching over my soul. My soul to keep guarding over me ever, watching wherever I go. And when the winds blow, 
He is my shelter when I'm lost and alone. He rescues me, and when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children, and he is our father, watching over our soul. Great is his love for his sons and his daughters, watching wherever we go. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter. When I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. Last song for the evening is number 484. Number 484. We have some special instructions with this song because we're not going to do it the way it's written. Uh, normally, uh, men sing, everybody sings first line, and then we kind of split up and trade with the second verse, but we're just all going to sing the first verse together, all going to sing the second verse together, and then we'll all sing the chorus together. So it'll be nice and simple. Everybody on board? All right. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. Oh, when I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, worthy is your name. Hey, good job, y'all did great. Well, welcome once again to the Wednesday Night Huddle. I'm so glad to see all of you. I want to begin this evening with a quick question, and that is, if you had to pick your favorite book or favorite movie, what would you pick? What? Say again? The Bible. The Bi There's a good church answer. Good job. All right. And in the uh, suck-up department. I should clarify my question. If you had to pick your favorite non-biblical text, what would it be? <laughs> Your best friend too, right? Friend. Okay. No, yes, sir. The Book Thief. The Book Thief, okay. Somebody else, what's your favorite book or your favorite movie? Pillars of the Earth. Say again? Pillars of the Earth. Pillars of the Earth, okay. James Bond, I pick. There's a lot of those. I seem to remember one in New Orleans where they crashed a, sh a, a ship. It was the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. So maybe not that one. Uh, okay, so one of the others. All right. Well, it, yes, and it was the special effects were horrendous. Anyways, okay, I digress. And it should have died. It should have just stayed dead and buried. Okay. On that note, uh, what is your favorite book or movie? Magnificent Seven. Ooh, the Magnificent Seven. There are several of those. It was so good. Oh, the original one. Okay. <laughs> I have seen that one though. <laughs> I, coincidentally, I've seen that one, too. For the love of the game. Okay, for the love of the game. All right. 
Oh, Shawshank uh, Redemption, okay. That always makes the list somewhere. Okay, the African Queen, another quality one. Say again. Tuesday with Maury. I'm not familiar Tuesdays with that Tuesdays with oh, Maury. Two days, it's a book. Tuesday. Tuesdays. Tuesdays oh, okay. with Maury. Okay. It's a book. Okay. All right. Then i got to fix that. <laughs> uh, did I have one to begin with? <laughs> Say again. We, oh, stop it. <laughs> we need to have a talk. Uh, yes, ma'am. What's your favorite book or movie? English what? The English Patient. Patient? Okay, The English Patient. All right. Uh, my favorite book is actually a, a series, and that is The Wheel of Time. It is 14 books. Each one is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 pages. It was so long, I finally just had to get them all on Audible because I just didn't have time to read through it all. But the story arcs are great. I did. It was fantastic. <laughs> one last one. What is your favorite book? Or movie? Say again. The Shining, all right. There's another classic. And on that note, what is it about stories? We seem to be drawn to stories, whether it be a book or a movie. And, and the best stories are the ones that we're somehow able to find ourselves in. The ones that we can relate to the character and say, oh, I've been through that, or, or I was just like this person, or I remember when I... It's the stories that we can find ourselves in. It's interesting that Jesus spent a lot of time telling stories. In fact, much of what he says is in story form. Uh, parables. Even the miracles are to some extent story for they are a narrative recording what took place. Tonight we're going to read A, why did Jesus speak in stories? Why did he speak in parables? And we're going to encounter several parables here in Matthew chapter 14. It is 14. No, excuse me, Matthew chapter 13. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to encounter several parables in Matthew 13 about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is like and about how and about the possible responses to the gospel news, the message that the kingdom of God has finally arrived. We've been in the midst of Matthew, and you may recall the theme of Matthew is the kingdom of God. For over and over again, we're told that the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, or the kingdom of heaven, those who are in the kingdom behave this way because Jesus, who is the king, the ultimate king of righteousness, has come to establish the eternal kingdom of God. And here in Matthew, Matthew records not only how it comes to be, but how we can be a part of it and what it is like. And here in Matthew chapter 13, we encounter parables as to what the kingdom is like and the possible responses to it. If I can get somebody to read Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then I'm going to need somebody else to read verses 18 through 23. So you may want to make sure to pay attention to the screen. We're not reading it exactly as we normally read through the chapter, starting in verse 1 and all the way through. We'll read verses 1 through 9 and then verses 18 through 23. So first person, verses 1 through 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great, cloud, great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. All right, thank you. Before we read verses 18 through 23, I want to draw your attention to one thing. And that is the first three words of chapter 13, verse 1. That same day. We just got through reading through chapter 12. Do you recall what happened in chapter 12? It's okay if you need to cheat and flip back in your Bible and look at the headings real quick. What took place in chapter 12? It 
It's the man with the withered hand where Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Jesus had walked through the field of grain and been confronted with, why do your disciples do this on the Sabbath? And then he had been accused of something. Do you recall what he's been accused of? Working on the Sabbath. Not just working on the Sabbath. He has been accused of that. But he's, it's true. But he's been accused of something even more egregious. Okay? Something even more egregious. By doing everything by the power of Satan himself. All of this has happened in this same day. So that same day, Jesus tells this parable. After all the things that have taken place, uh, after being accused of letting his disciples do stuff on the Sabbath, after being accused of working on the Sabbath and not doing exactly what was right, and after being accused of doing works by Satan himself, he tells these parables. Moving on to verses 18 through 23. We'll come back to this one, I promise. But verses 18 through 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So what does this parable teach us? Yes. God, God wishes that everyone would be saved. But the truth is, when, when you read this, you realize that there are going to be so many more people who are lost than who are saved. Okay. Uh, the broad is the way, narrow, or broad is the road, and narrow is the way kind of idea. Yes. Um, it is interesting that I, I realize Jesus probably did not intend this to be a mathematical principle, but only 25% of those who heard were good soil. Uh, again, I realize that Jesus did not intend this to be a mathematical principle, but the text seems to indicate that there will be a high percent, only a low percentage who will be good soil and bear fruit. Uh, somebody else, what, what does this text teach us, this parable? Yes? That for some what? Faith. For some, faith is fleeting. That for some, faith is fleeting. Okay. Anything else? What do the different types of soils represent? Okay, attitudes or hearts, the different possible hearts or the different possible responses to uh, the word or to the seed that is sown. What things does Jesus point out that kill the seed or kill the word? I, I realize they're represented by thorns, they're represented by uh, rocks, they're represented by the bird, but what do those three th representations, what are they representations of? Okay, life. Okay, temptation. Jesus does explicitly talk about at least one or two and explicitly identifies them. Okay, uh, crisis, uh, the idea of persecution. Uh, when persecution comes, that the root wasn't deep enough. Okay, riches. Uh, riches, specifically the, the worries and cares of this world uh, that is represented by, by the thorns that they choke out. Choke out the, uh, the word. What does this parable teach us about Satan? Okay, powerful. Yes, sir. You've got to be on your guard. He's not happy once you've uh, left his uh, sphere of influence. Yeah. Uh, 
the text certainly teaches us that Satan is alive, well, and actively seeking to thwart the word. That this isn't just, you know, we talk about spiritual warfare, but sometimes we only talk about God and us, and we sometimes don't talk about Satan. Yet if we believe in light, we must also believe in dark. Now, that's not to say that the two are of equal power by any means, but that they are actively engaged. Oftentimes, when we look at this parable, what do we focus on? We focus on the poor types of soil. Uh, but I'd like us to focus upon the good soil. And to do that, we need to do what you guys are coming to love, and that is our wonderful group work. Uh, so hopefully you like the people who you are on the same row with, because I want you to answer two questions. What is the difference between good soil and bad soil? And how can we be good soil? I'm only going to give you, what, maybe five minutes or so to work through it. But what's the difference? That's the first question. What is the difference between good soil and bad soil? And how can we be good soil? What do you think? I'll give you about five minutes to work through it in your group.
told you I wasn't going to give you very long. So what did you come up with? What is, first of all, what is the difference between good soil and non-good soil? Okay, attitudes. Oh, additives, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, nutrients. Okay, the nutrients that's in the good soil. Okay. Part of the importance of good soil is having support of others. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, bad soils are full of rocks and just messy. Okay. You no, know, and you don't have a good if you don't have a good foundation in the uh, in the soil because of all those maybe weeds and rocks and everything. Not going to get much to plant. Okay. That uh, poor soil has things in it. Good soil does not. Okay. <coughs> Bless you. Any other difference? have to constantly tend that soil. I mean, you have to stay on top of the weeds, stay on top of all the bad things that can filter it, and you got to water it. Um, so it's, 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 it's constant. It never ends in terms of the work, which basically reflects what we have to do in our faith walk. The good soil requires constant effort. Okay. Yes, ma'am. In your childhood, it depended on how many kids you had as to whether or not you had good soil? Yes, sir. Okay. Because the six kids in our family were, had to be out there every year when the garden was tilled and pick rocks out of it. And we had a huge pile of rocks before, by the time we were grown. Okay. And boy, did we hate it. <laughs> but we had a great garden. I bet. Sounds like it was a very good garden. Renee told me to say this. <laughs> no, Way she, to throw her under the no, bus. That's not what she said. She said I was our. Uh, oh, our you were the spokesperson. Got it. I'm following now. You know, there, there's several things involved here. Uh, we all sin, all sin and fall short of the glory of God, and so someone in their walk in life may have a lot heavier load to start with, and getting rid of those things. And then also the the I mentioned uh, the the attitude or the heart, uh, you know, and just growing in that faith, uh, step by step and day by day. And so uh, there's there's times when we need to, you know, be our brother's keeper. And when we see those things, follow up with him and help him to to grow and help help you to grow uh, in doing that. And what else did you say? <laughs> Very good job, Renee. Yes, sir. You know, words of study blocks to a lot of people words and study, but it's far more than that. My father, we worked on him our lifetime, and we got him to go to a Jimmy Allen. sermon and I thought that was just great and afterwards I said dad how did you like that wasn't that just great he said son I couldn't understand a thing he said he talked like a tobacco auction <laughs> you know but it's more than words you got to be able to understand words that I never thought that accents and things would hinder people not knowing about Jesus so I just really words enough, you know, the way people look at one part of the Bible and another part of the Bible and they compare it and think this is overseas, this one, but it's, it's just, it's just more, more than that. It's just a lot more complicated than we normally think. I have a follow-up question. Does 
does the growth of the plant indicate good soil? Go ahead. If you live in a mountainous area, it always amazes you that. It always amazes me that you can't grow a tree in your backyard. You water, you, you baby it, you do whatever. But then you go into the mountains and there's these trees that are growing on no soil at all. Like they're coming right out of the side of a, of a, of a mountain. Like the Rocky Mountains where we are, walk. And, uh, and so I was saying, I think that's where sheer determination comes in where you just say, I am going to be the good soil. I'm going to, I'm going to be hard and, and hardy. And they're hardy. Like they're, they're tall and beautiful, but they have no soil. But I, it's, uh, to me, there's, there's something there that far deeper because the roots are down deep and they're solid. They have a firm foundation. And we need to learn in life to have a firm foundation mm -hmm. just like they do. Notice that Jesus says there's only one differentiating factor between all between good soil and all the other soils. What is that differentiating factor? Depth. Yep. Though that might be one of them. But there's one differentiating factor that Christ specifically identifies. Yep. Bears why I asked, does the growth of the plant matter? Sure, because to be able to bear the fruit, the plant has to grow. But notice that Jesus says that two of the soils, two of the poor soils, the plant grows. For this is the plant that sprouts, but when persecution comes, its roots weren't deep. For this is the plant that grows, but as it grows, the thorns grow up with it and choke it out. That the differentiating factor was whether or not it produced fruit, which naturally leads to the question, what is fruit? What is the fruit of the life of a Christian? What do you think? Say again. It's the byproduct of when soil is when soil is tended and taken care of properly. It's the byproduct of that effort. That's an excellent way of saying that good soil that that uh, uh, soil that bared fruit was soil that bared fruit. Okay. <laughs> Great. I, what I'm curious, in the life of a Christian, what specifically does it look like? What is it? Bringing others to Christ. Okay, that's certainly one of them. Bringing others to Christ, that as we bring others to Christ, we uh, produce fruit. But is it the only fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. We're specifically told about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, all those things. And if we read through the text, it's as we walk with the Spirit the fruit has grown within us. So there are kind of two fruits. There's the fruit of uh, that we bring others, that perhaps we bring the bounty, if you will. But there's also the fruit of the life that we live. And so the question that we as Christians have to ask ourselves is not have we sprouted, but are we bearing fruit? Because Jesus says that that is the differentiating factor between good soil and poor soil. Which leads me to this question. Were... Did the good soil experience any of the challenges of the poor soil? Were, were there any rocks in it? Were there any weeds in it? Uh, were there any birds swooping by trying to steal, uh, trying to steal the seed? What, what do you think? Did, did the good soil experience any of the challenges of the poor soil? I'm sure it stands up to reason that they probably did. Uh, several of you referenced the idea uh, of gardening, uh, and specifically, specifically you, Brother Ralph, talking about the constant need to nurture the ground. Right now in my backyard, there are weeds because it's rained a lot, and so there's a constant need to try and pull these weeds and get rid of them, just like in any garden. There's a constant need, whether your garden is big and ginormous or whether it's limited to one little bitty pot, to continuously water it, uh, maybe even to continuously churn the soil a little. I remember when we had a garden growing up. It didn't matter how many times we tilled that ground, we would always find more rocks. Now, what does that mean? then? If the good soil experienced the same challenges, if it experienced Satan trying to take the seed away, 
if it experienced the uh, intense heat of the sun and times of drought, if it experienced uh, weeds trying to grow up in it, then what was the difference between the good soil and the poor soil? Okay, that sometimes, uh, sometimes it seems to come as one extreme or the other at times. Yes, sir. The strength of the root system was important. Yes, sir. Okay, the intention of the gardener, and this leads to the question, who's the gardener? Is it? Is it? We are. It's like I asked my son on his math problem. Why is that? Well, it must be this. No, you were right, but why? Uh, It's kind of how I understand it. We are the fruit that you are growing in your garden. Okay, you took that and a different we, way than what I did. No, we have to hear the words that you are telling us and understand it. If we don't understand it, regardless of how good your soil is, we're going to fall away. Okay. That, that when, the, when the seed is sown, that we have to work upon trying to hear it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I mean, to understand it indicates seeking God for the answer. So I kind of feel like the weak ones didn't turn to him, whereas the good soil, those did. They sought to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, James, the, the brother of Jesus, writes in the first chapter, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you find, uh, whenever you uh, face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And it goes on to talk about the things that are being built up. And if any of you ask for wisdom, God gives that wisdom without favor, uh, seeking him, seeking to grow in him. And uh, like I say, if someone has a, uh, a problem with sin from his past, he's, he, God can help him, but also he needs his help, help of his brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. I think the question needs to be asked, why are each of these fields in the condition they're in? Uh, these fields are hearts, and uh, in in the context of the first century with the sower going out, it's very clear that the hard ground is hard because it's been used as a path. It's been, the way Luke puts it, is men's feet. It's been trodden under the feet of man. Uh, why is uh, the field full of thorns and thistles? Well, that's a figure of speech that's used a number of times in the New Testament to apply to a plot of ground that hasn't been worked. Uh, if you go into their areas in southeastern Ohio where if uh, you don't work on that field, uh, a thistle called model flora rose will literally take the field over to the point where the only way you can clean it out is to bring a caterpillar in and pull them up by the roots. But that only happens where the fields have not been worked. If the field is rocky, it's because you didn't have six kids and uh, you didn't work on the field. And so ultimately in all of these, the individual is responsible for the condition of his heart and what he's doing with his heart. Ah, so who's the gardener? Oh. Yeah. Listen to what the word says and deceive yourselves, but do what it says. So listening, 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 reading, 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 but we really have to apply it and do what it says. I think that's what the difference is. Yeah. So, who, okay, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do that which we read. So who's the gardener? We are. 
Now, God certainly works upon our heart. He's the, he sows, uh, helps to sow the seed. Uh, God certainly tries to help us prepare the the uh, prepare our hearts and at times he sends things to help prepare our hearts such as when our hearts are hard he may send something to try and break that ground up uh, when uh, when our hearts are full of rocks he may try and bring something along and try and help shovel those out or at least bring them to our attention but we are the gardeners of our own heart that we prepare the soil of our own heart with how we interact with the word uh, did you notice the progression in the in, in this parable it's, notice in verse 18, or in verse 19, when anyone hears, so we have to hear it, but then have to receive it in verse 20, have to understand it, and then we have to do it, that there's this, almost this progression. You know, Peter talks about that there are things that Paul says that are hard to understand. Reminds me of those super gumballs. I don't know if you ever, guys ever tried one of those. Those uh, jawbreakers where you just kind of got to let it ruminate in there for a while before you can kind of start to chew it. Because if you try and crunch down on it right off the bat, well, it hurts. But sometimes the word is like that too. Of We try and work our way around it, but we kind of got to let it sit there for a minute to be able to ruminate before we can work on it. But there are some things we get, but there are some things we kind of have to work at. Jesus uses the idea of gardening here, I think, to help us understand that it is a continual effort. That it's not as though we did one thing with our heart and the soil of our heart and now we're done. Because if we do that with our garden, what happens? Well, eventually the soil ceases to be worked and it becomes hard and packed down. Uh, eventually, uh, there are rocks that are underneath there that kind of manage to somehow work their way up to the surface, almost as if somebody keeps tossing them in there. The weeds start to grow. But it's a continual effort of preparing the soil of our heart so that the roots can deepen and so that it can grow more and so we can produce more fruit. Because there are sometimes things in our lives, spots in our heart, if you will, that are kind of hard, almost like they're rocks. And God works and tries to prepare or tries to uh, help draw our attention to those aspects in our hearts so we can get those rocks out so the, 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 the roots can grow a little bit deeper. There's a lot of things to worry about in this world. At least a lot of things we think we're supposed to worry about in this world. A lot of concerns, and if we're not careful, uh, those thorns manage to sprout and continue to grow within our hearts. So there's this continual need to prune the things we find ourselves worrying about. But the, the question we are to ask is, are we producing fruit? And how can we cultivate the soil of our own heart? Let's not... We need to recognize that the hearts of others may be different. And that's often how we take this text. But I wonder if the text is trying more to ask us, what is the soil condition of our own heart, rather than asking the question, what is the soil of everybody else's heart? But are we cultivating the soil of our own hearts? You're right. We don't know when the challenges are going to come. We don't know when the birds are going to swing in. We don't know when uh, there's going to be a drought. We don't know when there's going to be a storm. We don't know when uh, the weeds are going to start propping up. But what we can do is do what several of you have mentioned, the idea of putting into practice what we see. We often talk about that we need to feast upon the word and read the word. And we should, for the implanted word is able to save our souls. And yet, as many of, several of you pointed out, if we merely read the word and do not do the word, then we're not actually cultivating the soil of our heart. But that we are to continually cultivate it, continually practice the spiritual disciplines, so that the so that the word is more fully able to take root within our lives and so that ultimately we are able to produce more fruit. Any thoughts before we shift gears a little bit? Yes, sir. One quick thing. Each progressing verse in this chapter 
builds on the other to the next to the next to the next and uh, you can't go wrong in this this formula but, but there is an element of progression of of hearing it uh, of uh, receiving it uh, of allowing it to, to ruminate and then ultimately doing that which we All right. If I can get somebody to read verses 10 through 17 for me, please. And the disciples came up and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to those people it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And with reference to them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will listen carefully and will never understand, and you will, closely, you will look closely and will never perceive, for the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they hear with difficulty, and they have shut their eyes so that they would not see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. But your eyes are blessed because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. All right, thank you. Why does Jesus say that he talks in stories, that he talks in parables? Yes. I think about just the, 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 you know, the culture of the time. I mean, oral history, people didn't have books to read, and, and so stories were told orally. People learned and heard things from people speaking, and so that was a way that people communicated and understood things okay. in that culture, in that, in that time. Okay, to, to follow the, the pattern of the culture. Why did Jesus say that he teaches in stories? Yes, sir? A parable lays down a story that people are familiar with in their life. And then he then from that develops the spiritual story that, that balances that. So as he's teaching these things, in that rural agrarian society of the time, they're familiar with the, the story he tells. And then he makes, uh, in the parables, he usually gives the answer in the parable. They're not analogies, they're not anything else. He usually gives, at the end, gives the answer to that in the, in the parable. Okay. Why does Jesus say that he teaches in parables? Was it because he um, he didn't want the hard-hearted to understand it? 
He only wanted the certain hearts to understand it. Now that raises an interesting question. Because Jesus seems to be explicitly stating, I'm speaking in parables so that they won't understand. But the other things that we've said are, are true, that, that, he helps us remember, that they help us remember it. It was part of the society. It helps us to enter, understand uh, aspects of the kingdom of heaven. But one of the stated reasons was so that they wouldn't understand it, which leads to the question, why? Why would Jesus not want people to understand about the kingdom of heaven? Uh, here in the, well, you're already there, so we'll go there and then over here to Larry. Mine's short. Just the possibility of persecution if the message wouldn't go any farther. Okay. So you, okay. Yes, sir? understand it okay so it's all what's what's inside of you what uh, what your heart is okay that ultimately Jesus is wanting to uh, us to respond based upon the condition of our heart okay any other thoughts because I thought Jesus wanted everyone to know about the kingdom of heaven so why is he phrasing it in such a way so that some won't I think he's, or I feel like he's doing it because of what the Pharisees are doing, because they don't get it, and they they hear, they hear but they don't hear, and they see but they don't see. I mean, and that's the constant struggle that Jesus has had in speaking to the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, is they just don't, they're looking for ways to, uh, to basically back him in a corner and bait him if you will so by speaking in parables he know i mean he knows all so he knows that they're not going to understand okay yes sir. well he's he, he's just talked about in my mind all the pharisees who had the misconception of what was really going to take place all the old law and then and then he says in verse 23 but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. And I think the only way you can understand it, you have to put a lot of effort in to, to finding out really what he's saying. And I, I think that's what he, he doesn't want to make it simple. Like you have to put in the effort to study, to read, so on and so forth. You have to have the Holy Spirit within. You have to pray a lot. You have to do a lot of things like that. But it's, it's I, to me, he sums it up in that one, one half verse, and and where he says, the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word, and understands it. So how do you understand it? You got to put in the effort. Hmm. I, 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 anyways. When, uh, oh, I just lost his name. Uh, Constantine, when Constantine declared, who was the emperor of the Roman Empire, declared himself to be, quote, a friend of Christianity. Overnight, the church is filled with unconverted people who were there for political reasons. Uh, one reason was to avoid persecution, another was special offices and special opportunities from the government and so on. What was the effect of the church being filled with crowds of unconverted people? The effect was we got the Catholic Church. And I think that this is God's way of, this is Jesus' way of, could we call it calling the herd? So that, that's a terrible phrase. But uh, of saying, of, of avoiding filling churches with, with unconvertible. Now, we want unconverted people in the church to reach them. But we don't want a church full of unconvertible people. Uh, Larry, I'd like to go back to what you were talking about. We see a difference between the Pharisees' response and the crowd response and the disciples' response. For Jesus does provide an explanation of this parable, but what has to happen for him to provide that explanation? He got questioned. He got questioned. The, the effort you're talking about, that for those who didn't want to hear, they just come, oh, well, that's a cool story. Yeah, I'm a gardener too. I can see that happening. But for those who wanted to know, 
And the, the Pharisees are like, wait a minute, what, what? And so they come to Jesus and then ask the question. It's almost as though not that Jesus doesn't want us to hear, for he wants all people to come to him. We know from Peter uh, that God desires all people to come to him. He doesn't want anyone to not experience salvation but that Jesus wants us to pick a side. For he's also going to say, the one who ha- for the one who uh, has, more will be given. For the one who doesn't have, even what he has is going to be taken away. In other words, we ultimately end up having to pick a side. Uh, of what do we do with that which is hard to understand? For Jesus has said within uh, what you were summarizing there, of both hearing and understanding, and the parable he talks about the one who hears, the one who understands, the one who does, and that's almost a progression of learning. That, and we've all experienced it where you first hear something you're like, huh, I had never thought about that. And then sometime later it's, oh, well that's what that means. And then sometime it's later it's, oh, you know, maybe I ought to do something about that. And there's this progression that seems to take place within growth. But to do that requires holding what is difficult and ruminating on it. And when we don't know the answer, it requires going to the one who does have the answer. That I can't help but wonder if at times God gives us really difficult situations and questions that we can't answer so that we'll come up to him and do exactly what my, my nine-year-old son does. Why? So that we'll come up and ask him and engage with him and seek the answers because the moment that the disciples sought the answer, Jesus was now able to engage with them and teach them more about what the kingdom was like. It's sometimes in that moment when we begin to ask the question, why would God want me to do this? Or why would he say that? Why would he say it in that way? It's the moment we begin to ask that question that now we're ready for the answer. Because before we might have had the answer, but we really weren't concerned about it because we hadn't been ruminating on it. But now that we are concerned about it, now that we've asked the question why, now that our ears are ready to listen, now we can have the answer. But it required going to God to get it. Now, perhaps the difference between the soils is the one who went to God and sought after him and the one who didn't. And that Jesus ultimately is trying to separate, getting us to pick one side or the other by kind of hiding things so that we have to seek it. And specifically so that we have to seek it from him. Which leads me to this question. Oh, we have one minute. Okay, that's all right. To whom does Jesus reveal the secrets of the kingdom? Because he says, to you the secrets of the kingdom have been revealed. The apostles. The apostles. It's not a you like to us, but rather to the apostles. Now, later on, Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and in Ephesians chapter 3 will talk about having revealed the mysteries that have been entrusted to him, that the mysteries are also revealed to us through the apostles, but that initially they are revealed only to the apostles. But for them to have been revealed to them, the apostles had to go ask the question. We'll wrap up here for the evening, and I'll leave us with this thought. I wonder, do we ask why enough because I wonder if there comes a point in time where we begin to cease asking why not necessarily why would you do this to me as much as well, why is the kingdom like that perhaps because we've heard the stories so often and we cease asking questions of them or perhaps because we're so used to our understanding of God that we stop asking the question, well, why are you like that? Or why did you do that? But it's only when we ask the question why and come to him for the answer, not looking to ourselves, not looking to everybody else, but come to him for the answer, that now we're ready to hear what he has to say so that the soil can be better cultivated so that the roots can grow deeper and we can produce fruit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are to come to him for the answers to the questions that we ask of him. Let's pray together and we'll be done. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that you are the God you are. We're so thankful that you've chosen to reveal yourself to us. And we ask that you help us to see what you have us to see and apply to our lives. Lord, we love you and quite to be with you in Christ's name.